Well, it's an unusual day for me. I've never presented uh, to an audience like this, but the day has been very inspiring because we've had a number of speakers telling the truth as they see it, different versions of the truth, of course, but nevertheless, it's always a privilege to hear that. Uh, we've heard a bit about disruption today. Um, I can speak to this very personally because if we discount my move to Elsevier as being one of them, um, my career has been disrupted three times as a surgeon. In 1980, I was in a gastric surgical unit when somebody discovered that peptic ulceration was caused by infection, and overnight, um, half the surgeries disappeared. About five years later, I was carrying out urinary stone surgery, and somebody invented endoscopic treatment and lithotripsy, open surgery vanished. And finally, in my final phase of my surgical career, carrying out open operations for prostate cancer have pretty well disappeared. They're now carried out using a robot, which was the final bit of learning I, I had to do technically as a surgeon. So um, that's my background. Um, it hasn't escaped my attention that the um, business of academic publishing uh, is still somewhat controversial. And we've heard this morning some of that. And one of the things I wanted to explain to you as an audience, and really I felt very much from the previous speaker, is we can do better. I think we can make a real difference. I think publishing has a huge future, but we have to listen to the direction that things are going in. So my background, I've had almost 40 years in full-time academia, uh, professorships in Newcastle, Oxford and Cambridge, director of research in Newcastle. And the reason I came into Elsevier was because I was passionate that using knowledge-based healthcare and knowledge-based research, we can make health a better thing and we can make the world a better place. And I felt that a large company like Elsevier with its background was very much a place where I could help that transition that the publishing industry is clearly in the middle of at the moment. And to the point we've heard, transitioning from simply presenting ad admittedly curated content has to change. We have to do better in providing knowledge in a way that it can be easily, more easily assimilated. So we've heard some about this already, but the, the amount of knowledge that has been created is, is huge and nobody can keep up with it. And this graph, is, it should say it's a logarithmic scale this is for health publications, but it could equally apply to life sciences. And you can see the massive expansion in research output. In my own field in particular, nobody can keep up, no individual can keep up with the genetics of prostate cancer. It's growing every day. And the idea that a single doctor will be able to provide adequate treatment for that patient is really a thing of the past without the help that we as an industry can bring. We're very familiar with peer review, but looking at the literature, I see that it actually only appeared in 1967, and um, we've heard an eloquent exposition this morning from the president of this organization of how mathematics, as a, as a specialty, uh, views review. A lot of review taking place in the community prior to an article being accepted for peer review. So there's a, there's a big problem for us to solve here. And I would say um, it's really important that we think of working in partnership with our academic communities to solve these problems. It's, it's really important we learn what their problems are. So the first thing I, I wanted to say to you, because I feel sometimes the industry is feeling battered, is that we have done a great job. You know, we have added huge value, and I, you know better than me the things that we've done. This is what we do. We support submissions, peer review, hosting. We provide curated long-term data. We support scientific and medical societies. And something that hasn't been talked about very much today is this question of re reproducibility, quality, and integrity. And we've taken a leading role in trying to do that. And despite some of the things that we say, I can speak, uh, this is a, from practical experience, as a group leader, uh, young scientists are not so concerned with the business of publishing and publishers as some of the speakers this morning might lead us to believe. Um, what they're interested in is their career, and they know 
uh, how tenure track works, despite, again, some of the comments we heard this morning, and that the journal brand still remains uh, a proxy for trust and quality within the ecosystem. And it's a shared issue. Um, this, is, this is the scientific community of which I've been part, using the place that papers are published as a proxy. And um, we, we know, for instance, that um, David Sweeney will know this full well in the ref that if you plot out impact citations in the life sciences against scores in the ref, there's a very strong correlation. So this is, this is what we do, but are we clear on our mission for the future? And probably not. So uh, this is a, a diagram plotting out uh, research expenditure. And up here is this is the number of scientists and engineers per million of the population. And this is the spend on GDP per head of the population. And the importance of China was emphasized in the previous talk. I mean, the, the balance is shifting to China in terms of the quality and the quantity of research output. Very high quality articles are being produced. And keeping up to date, this, this takes people time. And again, we, we can do better than simply respond to a search command through, um, through pulling. You know, we've got to be able to push this information to people who are asking for it. There's an increased output, more data sets. How can we help? We need, we need to do better than we have done traditionally in the past and, and make a step change, I think, of, of what we do. So these are just some personal thoughts about what, from a view of a clinical academic, of what the mission of publishers might be. What are the really important things that I worry about as an academic clinician? And I, I think to the point we've heard several times today, and I, it's figuring large in the meeting that Bob and Arnold have organized, is that we need to be thinking much more carefully about providing information analytics to help scientists and clinicians improve the quality of what they do. Um, certainly, we do this quite well, the discovery of validated and curated information and knowledge, but we should be able to help do this better through tools involving natural language processing and artificial intelligence. So this needs to be personalized to the person at the other end. In other words, if I'm sitting there as an expert in a particular domain, I want information pushed to me that's relevant. I mean, we've all must have um, suffered from this in searching on Amazon. I bought my daughter some uh, things to kill moths. Um, she had an infestation with moths in her London flat. And within two weeks, I was getting pushed uh, things to kill rats or mice or any other vermin. And, uh, you know, it's not that we need to be more intelligent about how we do this. One important thing I would do, really do want to say um, is that the decision support that we provide, the information analytics that we provide, has to be in the workflow. Uh, for a busy clinician, um, they don't have the time to log out of their electronic health record and log into another system. We, we need to be embedded with, within their day-to-day -day workflow, and I think this is also true of researchers. And, there's no doubt that social networks are becoming more important, as, as you mentioned in science. And supporting multidisciplinary working in team science remains a problem. I have a colleague in Oxford, a very senior colleague, and he tells me he spends a lot of his time uh, advising young researchers in Oxford as to who to go and talk to, who's an expert in X or Y. And you, it's not easy to find. And again, we should be able to provide that sort of information much more easily for people. I, I, I really want to uh, dwell on this a little bit more, and I'll come on to this um, in a moment. So in summary, this is a slide from my colleague Martin Clearan, is that I clearly believe that we need to move from this uh, to this, where we are actively involved in generating new knowledge from content, in adding value in a way that we've not really done thus far. So to move on to reproducibility in science, it's been a big topic, but from a government perspective, um, I know for well talking to my senior colleagues in, in Elsevier that uh, this is brought up regularly in discussions with politicians that they're funding research and um, what they're hearing is that maybe only a third, two thirds is reproducible in the long term. This, this slide is a little bit complicated, but 
Um, if we take physics and engineering, if respondents within physics and engineering all felt that their research was highly reproducible, there would be a big blob up here. But you can see physics and chemistry professionals feel that by and large their research is pretty reproducible. But if you move to biology and medicine, there's a significant proportion of people here that genuinely feel that a lot of what is published is not reproducible. And so this is a real issue. And I, I should say, I, this does not necessarily mean it's an issue of research integrity. I mean, it clearly covers a wide variety of things from carelessness, from not reporting methods accurately, and also from true biological variation that every individual has a different genome, they're going to metabolize drugs differently, they're going to respond to things differently. So there are genuine reasons for this. Uh, we've heard a lot about open research data and open algorithms, software. I think that that clearly can help and Wouter Hack, I know, is going to be talking later about our approach to research data management. So what, where, where are the things that we should be doing to support the academic ecosystem? Um, probably all of you in the audience have done research and in these areas, but these are the things that researchers, frontline researchers, not necessarily research leaders, worry about. They worry about keeping up to date, how they're doing, reviewing, editorial, reading, writing, and so on and so forth, finding people. So these are things where we can do more uh, on a day-to-day -day basis in the researcher workflow to help people keep up to date, connect them, helping editors peer review, and so on and so forth, and particularly publishing data. We've heard that you know, increasingly a high quality data set as it is published is a perfectly good scientific output. It may well be very reused and it, in my own field where we're doing a lot of work sequencing the genome of people with prostate cancer. Pulling those data sets together is hugely important. In fact, um, I, I learnt perhaps a little later in my career than I should have done that you know, to answer the questions that are of real world importance, you need huge data sets. We're not talking of thousands, we're talking of hundreds of thousands of patient data being brought together. So I'm going to finish off in the last two or three slides by talking about um, challenges for the healthcare system. And many of these challenges are, are global, um, and some of which we've heard about. People are living longer. Uh, there's the impact of dementia, multiple morbidities and drugs, frequent admissions to emergency rooms. And the, the, it's often said um, in a rather fleeting way that a lot of healthcare expenditure occurs in the final years of life. And it, it, it does to a degree, but there are other high cost populations. So people with uncommon diseases, people having transplantations and so on um, are high cost populations. So this is the high cost population as determined by insurers in the US, 18 million of them. There's about two million who are at the end of life and about three quarters of them end up incurring very high cost care. And partly it's a, it's a social discourse is as people reach the end of life, do they actually want to spend that time in hospital on an ITU, um, you know, unconscious and so on and so forth? Is it, there's, a, there's a big debate to have about what we, how we want to approach end of life care. There are, so not all high cost items occur at the end of life. Um, this is a preventable problem that um, the increase in diabetes, obesity, musculoskeletal problems is a preventable problem. It's caused by nutritional overload, Simply, simple as that. Healthcare is subject to inflation of around 8% a year, um, which is a problem. And I'll talk a little bit about unwanted variation of costs of medical care, which, sorry, the errors in medical care, which again, as an industry providing knowledge, we should be doing more about. This is the uh, slide showing the health and social care expenditure as a proportion of GDP. 
and I've grouped them together because often the dividing line between healthcare and social care is not as clear cut as it might be. And you can see that some of the um, social care economies in Europe um, lead the way, if, that, if they really want to lead the way, that France is spending nearly 35% of its GDP on health care and social care. It's not sustainable, clearly. I mean, it, it's huge. The US um, has an extraordinary balance of spending the most in the world on health care, but very little on social care. And you can see the spread. The UK traditionally has been a very low cost economy for health care. So what about preventable errors in medicine? Um, this is a study which looked at 1,000 records. 10% of patients had an adverse event, one in 10. And in fact, quite often, that figure's higher because that 10% that has more than one adverse event. So the number's probably nearer 15%. Similar study, 1,000 hospital deaths 10 years later, 5% of them were preventable. And in, in England, this accounts for 12,000 deaths that could be avoided. Importantly, and I, I'm not diminishing the importance of this, but importantly, the majority of these were actually occurring in people who were judged by the reviewers to have probably less than a year of high quality life to, um, to have. So how am I doing for time, Bob? I'm all right. So I think there are a number of important issues that I think we as an industry need to really understand. We need, we need to have a deep understanding of our partners in healthcare and in universities as if we're to work with them and to have a viable future. So I think for health, um, death caused by error is probably not a very good proxy. I mean, it's an extreme example and you, know, you either have it or you don't. There isn't much doubt about it. But there are other complications that clearly incur very high cost. So for those of us involved in providing healthcare informatics, improving diagnostic error, reducing unwanted variation, and AI-led approaches to embedding pathways in the clinical workflow is going to be very important. I think improving research reproducibility is going to be a a key issue because it's got impact on drug development. And just as an example, there's quite a lot of discussion about precision medicine. So if you look at the human genome, only 70 to 80 percent of it can be reliably sequenced. And by that I mean if you take 100, 100 patients, you send them all off to Illumina, they're all sequenced by the same company, and then you apply 10 algorithms to, to work out where the variants are, there's only about three quarters of them that are replicated across those different methods. And that has huge implications for precision medicine if we're going to rely on these approaches to target drugs. So we can do more here. Um, I think somebody's talked already today about open reporting of methods that are genuinely reproducible. I mean, as a, as a scientist trying to access research data, it's a huge problem because data sets are supposedly open, but when you download them, you find that there's a lot of errors there, that there's quite a lot of information missing, and nearly always you have to go back to the original author to try and get the information that you need. I think decision support embedded in the day-to-day -day workflow is going to be key. Just as an example of disruption, uh, image analytics is going to make a huge impact on radiologists and pathologists. It's not going to put them out of work, as the hype has suggested. But let me give you an example. This is a patient with prostate cancer. And what you're looking at here is you're looking at the patient's head from the bottom. This is here, the patient's spine, spinal cord. This is the aorta coming through the diaphragm. This is the liver. This is the splenic artery. And there's a rather ill-defined shape here. But with image analytics, this is highlighted, so it's not going to be missed. This is now, this is real world, it's now, it's beginning to be introduced. So I'm going to go straight on to the summary, I think, just for, um, to make the few final points that I want to make. So I think we do have a great future. Um, I think we've heard a lot of um, comment back this morning um, worrying about our role in the ecosystem. 
I think the talk this afternoon from Annie has outlined that in a sense we need to be thinking on a much larger scale as to how we can help healthcare and science uh, more radically. There will always be the need for this, I think. Uh, I think the idea of just simply putting out research to see if it stands the test of time, uh, I just don't quite buy it personally, I may be wrong, but I think people do want some validation. I think we've got to be more smart about providing personalised approaches in the workflow for researchers and for doctors and to push knowledge appropriately to the people who are requesting it. I think the ecosystem is very concerned about this and we can work out how to help. We need data, we need data driven tools to help researchers and doctors do a better job. And I think we have an exciting future if we listen, learn, adapt and deliver new technological solutions to the community. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, David. Any questions? Yeah. Thank you. My name is uh, Ingrid Wijk, Master of the University Library. Thank you for your talk. Um, my question uh, regards a target group that Annie mentioned but didn't come up in your speech, and that's the group of students and learners. Can you say a little bit more about them and about how to educate them and how publishers and libraries can uh, yeah, do, uh, get, a, get along with that? Thank you for that question. I, I'll plead the same uh, reason that Annie did. It's, uh, I was limited to time. Um, but I, I, I think um, you're absolutely spot on. I think we, we, we are, I mean, as a company, we do have an AI-led solution for nursing education, which is now being expanded into medical education. So I think using our content that we have, whether it's from textbooks or reviewers, to provide solutions for learners, I think, that, that, that's personalised to them, actually. So if they're doing well on a particular field, they can move forward. If they're doing uh, badly in a particular field, there'll be more content pushed to them. So I think um, th that's how I think we should be doing, and I think the library is going to be key to that. I mean, clearly, for undergraduate education and providing better tools for students, I, I agree. David Sweeney down there. D David Sweeney, th thanks David. I, I totally buy the argument that, that there's uh, new, new things to be done, uh, value to be added uh, through big data and uh, artificial intelligence and all that. I think you've, personally, I think you've hit the nail on the head and I think uh, the work that your company and others who are represented uh, today uh, here to pioneer in this area is fantastic. What's not clear to me is whether that, that necessarily goes along with the core dissemination of information system, uh, nor for that matter whether it goes along with the, the trusted and validation thing, but I, I do think that's a separate issue. I, I can even see an environment where there's a bit of a conflict between an open publishing and open science system and what you might choose to do in adding uh, potentially incredible value uh, in uh, the kind of work you've discovered. And I'd say that point's all the sharper in that as publishers currently attempt to articulate the value they offer, and I don't doubt for a second they offer lots of value, but putting numbers on that and tying it to cost has proved difficult. Isn't what you're describing just a completely new business, which indeed will revolutionise research, but ought to be conducted on a separate model to the dissemination platform? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question, and I suppose one's got to think of the timescales that are involved, that some of these things are short term. So for instance, we can take clinical guidelines now, transfer them into a defined pathway for a particular patient, embed them in the electronic health record. That can be done here and now um, and can be based on knowledge, curated knowledge that we generate as a, as a publisher. I mean, so that, 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 that's a straightforward Thing. I mean, it clearly would um, be a different business and cost and all that's got to be worked out. I think 
in the longer term, what I've outlined in my, my talk is that that's going to take time. So I, I think providing new... So in other words, for instance, can you take a corpus of knowledge and analyse it through NLP and AI to produce new knowledge for researchers? Can that be done now? I, I beg somebody will correct me, but I don't think it can yet be done. So that's going to take longer. So I th I th the way I see it, um, David, is, is two things. I mean, one of them is that I think publishers are going to have to work together because some of the con because a researcher is pretty publisher agnostic, as I said at the beginning, they really don't care whether something comes from Elsevier or somewhere else. I mean, they're, they're interested in... So I think, I think there may be a degree of... There will, there will be a degree of cooperation required. So, for instance, if you are synthesizing new knowledge, it's no use just synthesizing it from Elsevier content. You know, that, that wouldn't work. So I, 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 I take your point. I think it's... I, my, my, my short answer to your question is that I don't believe the two things are different. I don't think they're inconsistent. I think our core business is providing curated, trusted knowledge and disseminating it um, and looking after it. I think that will remain, but we've got to build new things on it, I think to add, add greater value than we, than we are doing at the moment. Okay, well, thanks very much, David. Thanks uh, for a talk uh, that's got us um, right. We've got just about okay on time, Lizzie.